Hi, I'm Jason. I was wondering if I could hear from you. I have been hearing from people a sense of loneliness, a sense of, of feeling disconnected, which is a bit understandable and even predictable in the midst of uh, COVID. And kind of want to lean into that feeling, feeling a little bit and spend the next several weeks talking about feeling like we're in desert places and helpful practices when we're in desert places. So kind of calling this desert practices and was wondering if you know what I'm talking about when I say that, like, do you ever feel lonely? Do you ever feel like, like I've heard sentiments from people lately that I have, that I resonate with so much this, you're not sure if you really have a tribe. Do you know what I mean? Like, like you're not really sure you see different kingdoms around you or different tribes around you. And those kingdoms of those tribes seem to be getting louder and you don't really feel like you're part deeply part of those tribes. Do you know what I mean? Like you're not really part of some empire or some club. So we're going to spend some time talking about what it looks like to find ourselves in the midst of these, these desert places. And we're going to be discussing desert practices. And what I would love from you, if you would, would you email me at jason.english at theheart.us. Email me what are some ways that you have felt like you're in a desert place. You can be as specific as you want to, or you can be as general, or you can be abstract about it if you want to. You can use as many de details as you want to, or you can speak in a little bit more allegory. But what are some of the ways that you felt like you're in the desert and maybe without a sense of place? Because I think this is something that if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us are feeling right now for many different reasons. That something has happened worldwide to us in the midst of what the last five months or so, five or six months with, with COVID-19, we're, we are less connected than ever before physically. We are spending more and more time on video calls that's better than nothing and we're I'm, I'm thankful that we have those in this world because I might feel even more lonely if I didn't have some of those online connections with people and be able to meet with people on video calls but there's still something unnatural about all this isn't there there's something un even though it is good and it is safe and it is loving uh, to for the sake of the world, right? And for the sake of the spreading of a disease to, to stay at home and to stay distant. But, oh, it also feels so unnatural and feels lonely and it takes a toll on a lot of people. And I hear that from many of you and I felt that way in so many ways as well. And then, of course, there's a lot of discussion, heated discussion and different perspectives that have been in some ways helpful and in some ways pretty venomous around disagreements regarding racial injustice or racial inequality or different um, the different racial reconciliation conversations that have been going on some of which are not conversations at all of course some of which are kind of toxic um, back and forth arguments and and then of course we're in the midst of we're right in the middle of these next couple months being among the most polarized times in our country with a presidential election. And that can bring a sense of loneliness as well to many people where they're not quite sure where they fit in their peer group. They're not quite sure where they fit if they have a tribe and 
I want to kind of lean into that a bit over these next few months as a church family where we talk about what it means to have some disciplined desert practices. And I'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. But I'm being a bit abstract best I can right now on purpose because I'd love to hear from you. There are some desert practices that I'm not going to say right now because I really want to hear from you. What are some of those desert practices? What are some spiritual disciplines and practices that either individually or collectively the body of Christ does when they don't have a sense of place? Because, you know, historically uh, followers of Jesus have not always had an obvious kingdom or tribe that they've been a part of that are that are kind of like worldly tribes or worldly kingdoms. Obviously, there's the kingdom of God that we're a part of, but many times there are followers of Christ and followers of the way of Christ that have found themselves in the midst of a desert place. So let's learn from their example, but I want to hear from you. What are some of those desert places that you feel? What are some of the desert practices that you either observe or would like to observe? We talked about one. I'll give you a like a little starter here for a discussion. We, we talked about, for a few weeks, we talked about fasting. Uh, fasting, the desert mothers and fathers, these monks in the midst of literal desert places, fasting was and is a, re- a regular rhythm of a, of a desert practice. What do you do when you're in the midst of the desert? Uh, one of the things is to fast. And so what else? What else would you like to talk about? What else are you, have you experienced and would like to experience? And I just want to be honest with you. I thought that I knew what I was going to be talking about this morning. Uh, but something, but my heart wasn't ready. Do you know what I'm, do you know that feeling like you, you know what you want to say, but your heart's not quite there? And so I really wrestled with that, to be honest. I wrestled with, well, I worked really hard on a teaching that was kind of one of the first things that I wanted to discuss in the context of these desert practices. What is something that that followers of Christ do and can do corporately and collectively in the midst of being tribeless in the desert? And somehow my heart wasn't ready. Do you know? I've got notes. And I really, I really struggle with that, right? Because Sundays come every week and I'm teaching pastor. And so I worked on something else and it, again, wasn't there. It was, my heart wasn't ready. Content ready, heart not ready. And, uh, and so I got a beautiful text message from my friend, Pastor Reggie Hunt, I know some of you know Reggie and some of you have been there on some Sundays over the past five, six years where we've done some racial reconciliation teachings together. He's the pastor, founding pastor and, and current pastor of Cornerstone Summit Church. Uh, and I got a, a, an amazing text from him that's a follow-up of something that we've talked about at the heart in in one of our Sunday gatherings in in the high school. And that was their pursuit of purchasing property. And so let me kind of sum this up for those of you who weren't there for that or weren't able to listen online to that. Um, Reggie Hunt is the founding pastor of Cornerstone Summit. He started this church and they, uh, like the heart, they were mobile for a long time. Uh, But they actually have been pursuing trying to purchase land for a long time. It's a bit of a different philosophy of ministry with the current philosophy of ministry of the heart. Mobility is one of our values and we're not actively looking to purchase property. But but some more context about that is that uh, Pastor Reggie, as we've we've been talking about this for years together and even on the stage, uh, I don't remember when that was, but... I was going to say several months ago, but obviously it's more than that because um, it was when we were in the high school. And as they began the process of trying to purchase property, I said to the Hart family that even though we don't have a goal of purchasing land of our own, 
I wanted to ask you if you'd be willing to financially give to a different church in town buying property so they can have a church building. And many of you gave through the heart budget to Cornerstone Summit. And then I also know that many of you gave directly to their campaign. And um, some more context of that is that we heard from Reggie that if, if they were to purchase property, that it would be the first time in a hundred years or so, I think it's over a hundred years, but a hundred years or so since a church that had a pastor who was black purchased property. And that's a significant thing to hear. And I know that many of you, when we talked about that, when Reggie and I were on the stage and, and uh, we did a co-teaching together at Cornerstone Summit Gathering and also at the Heart Gathering, and that kind of rocked some of us to the core thinking about the implications of why that would be and what that means. And I think that what's been brought up recently among a lot of people is kind of this either reawakening or awakening to racism, to things that are not just, and some of those things being able to be tracked back to really horrible twistings of scripture, uh, people who claim to be followers of Christ having a lot of horrible, hate-filled, false theology. There's even a time where uh, when they went to go, when Cornerstone Summit went to go try to purchase some land, they found that there was a deed of that land and I don't remember when it, when the deed was written, but I, it's it's a th I want to say pushing 100 years ago or something like that. And it said on the deed that this land, this property, shall not be sold to a person of color. Now that's obviously unconstitutional and unethical and wrong and illegal, and that that deed that part of the deed isn't honored. But the point is that it's on the deed, which means somebody wrote that and somebody somebody signed that and passed that on as a deed and I can't even imagine I can't even imagine what that would feel like to be a pastor who's trying to help his church purchase property and see that on a deed Anyway, but I got, the, I got this phone call. So as I'm like, I thought I knew the teach, what the teaching was, and I wasn't sure, and my heart wasn't, I knew I wasn't quite ready, and then, you know, Sundays come exactly once a week, no matter what I do. And I was like, not, I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to teach on, and I don't know what my heart is preparing for. And I got this, I got the message from, Reggie and and he told me that they were closing on the purchase of their property and it's a different one than the one with the deed that I mentioned um, actually they've been in their this church building for a while and they've been leasing it but uh, so I got a chance to go right after they signed on right after they closed on the signing and they signed the papers and I got to go and, and be with, for a brief moment, Reggie and a couple of the leaders there at Cornerstone Summit. And it's a holy moment, even though it's just a building. And we know that God uh, does not need a building and God lives in more than a building. But there's also something about a sense of place. And there's also something to be said about being in a town where there has not been a church with a black pastor that owned property in over a hundred years. And I wanted to pause this morning and acknowledge the holiness of this, the weight of this, and also to thank you. There are many of you that gave to make this happen, for them to be able to have the down payment that they needed to go under contract 
to purchase the land and the building on the land, or I think it's built more than one building on the land. And he, right before I came here to press record, you know, he, he said, it's okay to share because we're going to tell our church now that, that this is official. And when, when one part of the body rejoices, the rest of the body rejoices. And when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. And so I think it's appropriate for us to have a bit of a, a bittersweet feeling right now of a suffering of the town that we live in where there are churches on every corner. It has been over 100 years since there has been a church with a black pastor that has owned land in Boone. And now, a stone's throw away from the high school where we meet, Cornerstone Summit Church, uh, with Pastor Reggie Hunt. It's theirs now. Uh, or the banks for now, but it's theirs now. And praise God and thank you for being a part of that. And so I want to just say two more things now and wrap this up I, I want to let you know or remind you what hopefully you already heard is that we're going to start doing communion every Sunday drive through communion so we got these little packets and I want to show you something about them it's a kind of an all in one little packet I know it's, it doesn't feel quite as special as like this, the cup and you dip it in and the whole deal but times are different now so we will have masks on and we invite you to drive through or walk through, bring your mask as well. And it's kind of this packet and you kind of lift up one little section of it. Like that, you see that? And it lifts up, see that? And it lifts up to the wafer. And then you lift up a whole nother section and it lifts up for the juice. And we're gonna do that every Sunday between 11.15 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. So, uh, just after we have our, our Sunday morning mobile church, hopefully you connect with the chat and then hop in your car or get on your bike or whatever, walk or whatever, come down to our church office. And we'll sanitize these and we'll wear our masks. And at least for a brief moment, we can see each other. Now, maybe you're only able to come every once in a while, but we've done this, excuse me, we've done this a couple times, but we haven't been doing it every week, so we thought we'd give that a try. We're going to do it every week. Uh, so one more thing, and that is for those of you, especially those of you that feel the most lonely right now, and you're, you're hearing this desert place thing, and you're like, yes, I'm in the desert right now, and I don't have community, and I don't feel connected, and watching some of these videos... Uh, while hopefully, you know, my other inspiring or helpful, it's not the same thing as these relationships. And I, I hear that and I've heard from several of you that you feel lonely and you feel disconnected. And I just want you to know that we hear that, we get that, and wanted to remind you of a very specific way uh, that we have tried to create a way to bridge that gap for you. And that's this thing that we call spiritual formation groups. It's not called that because we just kind of need some sort of program because it certainly doesn't have to be programmatic, but we want to organize people in a way that is helpful and serves people in a way that they can be together with each other, at least video call together for now. But if you're not part of a spiritual formation group, and you feel lonely. I just want to let you know that those groups exist for this very thing. 
So maybe you're not into program church kind of things and you're a little bit weary of this. And I just want you to know that these spiritual formation groups are not designed to control you. They're not designed to, to uh, try to make you into somebody that you're not. They're not, we're, no, we're not trying to brainwash you. Uh, you don't, we don't have leaders that try to make you be someone that you're not. These spiritual formation groups are just that. They're designed for us to enter into being formed spiritually. And also, they connect us with each other. And so, if you would, if you feel lonely and you're like, I've been watching sometimes, but I just don't feel, I don't feel the connection. And I just am not with people and I want some more deep friendships and I want to feel like I belong. This kind of a sneak sneak peek at part of the desert practice. But one of the things to do about that is to find small groups of people to be with. So if you don't have a full tribe, if you don't have a full kingdom that you're a part of, there are other wandering nomads in the desert. And we can be nomads in the desert together. So please let us know because we design these things for you. We did this not just for the sake of busyness, but the, for the sake of connectivity, for the sake of love, for the sake of community, for the sake of deep friendships, and for the sake of spiritual formation. So if you're not part of a spiritual formation group and you feel a sense of disconnection and loneliness, this is what we're offering. Would you consider letting us know that you're interested in being in a spiritual formation group? And unfortunately for now, that means meeting on a video call or maybe meeting to go to be outside together on, on a walk, socially distant and all that stuff. But it's, it can be the beginning of really deep, meaningful friendships that hopefully that when this season passes and we're able to meet face to face again, you'll be able to sit in a living room and share a meal and hug and greet with a holy kiss and all these things that we desperately are missing right now. Um, so would you consider doing that? And so my, my sisters and my brothers, if you are in the desert now, I want you to know that you're not alone. Your sisters and brothers see you. And of course, the Lord sees you. Thank you for giving not only to the heart, but also to Cornerstone Summit. It is because partly because of you, uh, that they're able to secure that property. And on behalf of Pastor Reggie, thank you. On behalf of his leadership team, thank you. Blessings to you. Uh, And hopefully you'll swing by, come have drive-through communion, say hello, greet one another from a distance. And then, of course, would you consider signing up for a spiritual formation group? May the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you and turn his face towards you and shine his light on you and grant you with peace. You are not alone, even if you are in the desert. And hopefully see you the drive through communion. If you are part of our extended church family, not in Boone, Please reach out to us if you want to get connected in the spiritual formation group anyway, because we have some hopes and some plans that we're working on to help you stay connected to this church family, even if you're not in Boone. Thanks.